am getting ready to audit some E&M levels and I'm going to read it and then audit it and then I'll show you guys what my audit tool looks like. Actually, these are outpatient. So we're not even using these. We need to use the new E&M for office and outpatient, the audit tool for 2021. So look, already we almost wasted time auditing the HPI exam, all that. When it comes to outpatient services and office visits, um, medical decision-making is your driver or what's the right term? How you would choose your level for billing your e &M. So our very first patient, this is her first pregnancy. And it says, um, we don't know how many weeks she is. It says unknown and estimated date of delivery not found. Patient presents with dehydration from hyperemesis, obstetrical history, unremarkable. Patient reports no vaginal bleeding, fatigue, nausea, or vomiting. And then it says patient states she had nausea and vomiting up to five times a day for the past few days and nothing is helping. She was seen in the office and her urine dipped for moderate ketones, so she was sent here for hydration. So let me go look through here. I don't see any labs at the bottom of my note. Plan to discharge with script for Reglan and Pepside. So we have a prescription drug management. So I can circle that one down there. It says mild to moderate dehydration. And we also gave IV fluids. So that too is gonna be in the moderate category because on our other one, it has said IV fluids without additives. And this one is IV bolus. So this one for moderate, they had IV fluids with additives. So that will be another moderate. Okay, so the very first one, I have these two marked off. And we're gonna go with a 99214. And then for my diagnosis code, we are going to use O21.1 hyperemesis gravidarum with metabolic disturbance. And you'll see um, in one of the descriptions they have below, starting before the end of the 20th week of gestation with metabolic disturbance, such as dehydration. And they did mention that she had moderate dehydration. So we do not need to code dehydration because it's already included in this code. We only need the O21.1 and then the weeks of gestation, which is Z3A01. And then this one is done. Okay, let's move on to my next triage note. My midwife did an addendum on one of the residents' notes and midwives cannot bill off of a resident's documentation. They are not teaching physicians. So for our midwives and all midwives, they have to document their own documentation. Hang on. Okay, I'm back. Packages in the middle of the day, of course, um, always. But anyway, our midwives and all midwives, they have to put their own documentation in the chart and bill off of that. You cannot bill or they cannot bill off residence documentation. So my midwife says, I have evaluated the patient and agree with the above plan of care. Patient describes small amount of vaginal bleeding following intercourse after, um, no, this was last evening and cramping, feeling above pubic bone, denies current contraction, scant streak of brown, on pad noted um, your analysis and affirm pending reactive nst patient discharged to home in good stable condition with precautions of contractions liquid leakage of fluid vaginal bleeding decreased fetal movement she is to keep her next scheduled prenatal visit appointment for tomorrow 
patient verbalized understanding and accompanies by significant other. Okay, so we're just gonna see what we have here to bill. I did see a reactive NST. Now, if she put documentation for that NST, like putting time in there, um, the baseline, if it was, um, she has that it was reactive. Um, but if she would have put details of that NST, I would have been able to bill for that, but she didn't. So we cannot bill for the NST. We'll only bill an E&M only. And what I can pull out of this is going to be so she had small amount of vaginal bleeding following intercourse um we did have labs so she ordered a urinalysis she has two minor self-limited problems she ordered labs but it also says any combination of two from the following. So we have the ordering for unique tests and review of prior external notes and review of the results of each unique test. Um, she reviewed the NST. So that's one right there. So this is what we have. For this note, we will be billing 99213. And my diagnosis code is going to be, um, it's going to be that postcoital N93 zero, but I need to put the O code first because she's pregnant. So we are going to be looking for O99, where's my N? Okay, 099-891 and then N93-0. And how many weeks is she? She is 38 weeks. I'm just gonna look one more place for this NST and see if we have it, but I doubt it. And then this last triage note that I have, my provider, now this is the actual physician, this is not a midwife. She attested it, um, a resident's note and she um, has acceptable teaching physician guidelines because she has here, resident participated in evaluation and management treatment of this patient. I reviewed the history, examined the patient, approved the orders, discussed the medical decision-making and patient's condition and management with the resident and the patient, I agree with the resident's plan of care. See resident's note for review of systems, HPI and exam. Patient is assessed by myself as well prior to discharge. Patient presents with contractions and decreased fetal movement. She began to have abdominal pain with tightening of her stomach. She denies recent intercourse. Reports that she has been adequately hydrating. The patient denies any vaginal leakage, discharge or vaginal bleeding, has not felt baby move since this morning. So our diagnosis code for decreased fetal movement is the O3681, and then however many weeks of gestation or trimester she is. So that's a three for third trimester, and she is 37 weeks. Um, let me see what else. She came in with contraction, so Looks like she was sent home. Let me double check. She was only one centimeter. We did a urinalysis, vaginitis panel. Okay, it says follow up outpatient for routine prenatal appointments. The patient's been notified that if she has any abnormal vaginitis panel results, she will receive a call. 
So it looks like we are sending her home. We have contractions and decreased fetal movement. And we have ordered the labs and reviewing them. So we're gonna have another 99213. I'm getting ready to review a vaginal hysterectomy, I think it is, or actually it might be a laparoscopic hysterectomy. And I like to have this little diagram of a uterus. I will try and see if I can find it, but all my pictures that I have at my desk, I just get them off Google and then I send them to my mom to laminate them. Um, because I don't have like one of those laminating machines here at home. I mean, I can get one, but my mom does it just fine. Um, I use these a lot when I first started out with OB because I wasn't sure what the provider was cutting when he said he was like cutting ligaments. So now when I'm reading the notes, I know what he's cutting. And, um, it's also helpful if you watch, um, YouTube videos of the surgeries being performed and there's plenty of laparoscopic um, procedures on YouTube for you to watch so you understand what is going on. But let's just read this op note here and I will point out to areas where when he says he's cutting them so you guys know. I might have to change my ring light setting so that way it's not so strong. We'll see. Patient is taken to the operating room and placed in dorsal supine position. Um, brief timeout were completed. Patient position in dorsal lithotomy position using boot stirrups and prepped and draped in usual sterile fashion. Foley catheter was placed and Cohen cannula, which was placed in the endocervical canal. Surgeon's gloves changed and midline umbilical incision is made with the scalpel carried by blunt dissection to the level of the fascia. The fascia is incised in the midline with approximately one to one and a half centimeters defect and open port placed. Internal balloon instilled with air, gel cap placed against the abdomen to allow for appropriate seal and adequate oxygen was placed to obtain adequate pneumoperitoneum. The blunt dissection was that this was able to free up the, this is a lot of information. Um, and we haven't even started the procedure yet. Well, we did, but we just haven't started doing what we need to do. Okay, right here where it says, after adequate visualization was obtained and the adhesions were free to the utero ovarian and blood supply to the ovary from the IP, which is the infundibulopelvic ligament, were clamped, fulgurated, and cut with the Liger Show device. So the IP, which is the in a fund of bulo pelvic ligament, which is where is it on my diagram? It might be okay here. Why isn't it on this one? Right here, this ligament is what he just cut first. So, whenever he's cutting this, or he or she is cutting this in in fundibulopelvic pelvic ligament, they are gonna be taking the tube and the ovary. So if you see IP or in fundibulopelvic pelvic ligament was fulgurated and cut, that means they're gonna be taking the um, uh, ovary and the tube. So let me keep reading. After the mass was freed from the blood supply and the surrounding structures, the 10 centimeter endo catch bag is placed through the umbilical port and the five millimeter scope placed in the left lower quadrant. Specimen was placed in the endo catch bag that was pulled through the umbilical incision. Fascia was incised another half centimeter or, or so to allow easier removal of the cystic structure and this was removed in entirety with no other cystic fluid, especially from the dermoids spilled into the pelvic cavity. The port is then placed once again through the umbilical incision and pelvis inspected and irrigated. There was good hemostasis where the adhesions had been leased and yet slight oozing from the region was detected. Its left ovary is easily flipped. There did appear to be corpus luteal cyst on the left 
This is not removed since it is hemostatic. So we did not take the left ovary, right? Lower quadrant ports removed under visualization. Good hemostasis noted after ports are removed. The right, left, lower quadrant ports incision closed. Mobile incision had fascia. Patient is taken to, oh, okay. So this wasn't even a hysterectomy, you guys. <laughs> I thought it was, but it's not. And that's how you know if it's a hysterectomy or not, because he did not say he cut any of the, um, the uterosacral ligaments or the, um, where is it? The uterine artery ligaments. Like he didn't cut the round ligament, the broad ligament. He didn't cut any of that. So the procedure's over. So all he did was take that right ovary. So our um, code for removal of a right cystic ovary, because it was a cyst on that right ovary, you are going to want to choose uh, da, 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 58661. Laparoscopy surgical with removal of adamexal structures, partial or total oophorectomy and or self-injectomy. Okay, you guys, that is it for this video. Make sure you give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And I will see you all in my next video. Bye.